Star Wars, a space opera as expansive as the width of the galaxy. For almost half a century, the franchise has engrossed millions and millions of fans across nearly every form of media. The epic sagas, set a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, are endless and have gone through countless canonical and non-canonical iterations. A classic on the scale of ancient epics of world mythologies and likely just as impactful, Star Wars did not emerge in a vacuum, a fact George Lucas himself would admit. Star Wars was inspired by the world around it, and these inspirations show us how its many creators see that world. In this video series, we will investigate the inspirations and politics of Star Wars, its factions and what their causes are. Join us on the Millennium Falcon as wizards and warriors embark on a journey to understand the origins of Star Wars. Ultimately, this sci-fi saga is rooted in the real world by the events and groups that inspired it, but a fantasy based in reality needn't travel beyond our time and galaxy. In fact, we've all the basis for heroics we need with our sponsor, Everyday Heroes. This is a tabletop RPG system for creating legends of the modern age. Craft an adventure starring unlikely heroes fresh off the street. For these adventures, you'll need farmers, scientists, drivers, teachers, priests, rich playboys and penniless students and many more, all with skills and rules detailed in the game. What kind of adventure will it be? Probably one filled with explosive action. Everyday Heroes aims to reproduce action movie scenarios with your own personal twists. The core book comes with reams of useful ideas and data, including details on how to use loads of equipment and vehicles, and what kinds of challenges you're likely to battle on a quest to defeat the modern menace of your world. But you don't always need to come up with your own world, Everyday Heroes can be expanded with cinematic scenario books that use the game's rules to play out an epic rendition of various IPs, with thematic special rules and considerations. Based on the D20 modern system, Everyday Heroes brings a 5th edition compatible update for those embarking on action-packed quests in the modern era. It's got a perfect score on drive through and it's easy to pick up if you've played any D&D before. Check it all out via our link in the description. Before we begin, we must acknowledge the debt this series owes to Chris Kempshaw's great book, The History and Politics of Star Wars, Death Stars and Democracy. Many of the sources for this series were found in its bibliography, and many of the thematic discussions you are about to witness were pulled from its pages. We also have looked at making of documentaries or discussions by directors and actors. Having given credit where it's due, let us now discuss the scope of what this series will discuss. Primarily, we will focus on the canonical aspects of Star Wars, with an emphasis on the three trilogies and major television series. However, we will also mention and discuss aspects from some of the video games, comic books, and the expanded universe to a lesser degree. The series will broadly discuss both the social and political themes of Star Wars, and the thematic and aesthetic inspirations behind it. We will try to look at it from both the viewpoint of George Lucas, and all others who painstakingly put their efforts into making the galaxy we know and love. Let us begin by discussing the ideology and real-world influences of the Rebel Alliance of the original trilogy, and by extension the resistance of the sequels. When it comes to George Lucas and the Rebel Alliance, his roots as a politicized artist in the 1960s are clear, with the Vietnam War as the major inspiration. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese armies were the conceptual bases from which the rebellion sprung as their fight against American imperialism is reminiscent of the rebellion's fight against the Galactic Empire. Many will have seen the interview of James Cameron and George Lucas, where the latter clearly outlines this. In said interview, he makes it clear that in his mind the rebels are analogous to an anti-colonial movement, fighting a massive, highly coordinated force. For Lucas, this is the fight against what he called the man. In short, the Rebel Alliance is an ideological product of the 1960s New Left, with its anti-authoritarianism and tendency to put the asymmetric rebels as the good guys over the industrialized imperial power. The 2016 film Rogue One continues the legacy of the original trilogy's anti-colonial themes, with some new historical influences. Some scholars have connected the cinematography to the 1966 film Battle of Algiers. The rebellion, according to Chris Kempshall, lies in Lucas's meditations on how and when armed resistance against oppression becomes necessary. It also translates to the guerrilla tactics used by the Alliance against the Empire, and the trench warfare reminiscent of the First World War in the Battle of Hoth in The Empire Strikes Back. 
The sense of overwhelming odds and technological superiority possessed by the enemy is a major theme in Star Wars, as the rebels try to outwit the Empire through tactical means and strategic strikes on locations like the Death Star. While in the expanded universe the morality of some of their tactics is questioned, the rebellion is nonetheless an analogy for the democratic ideal and for the struggle against imperial and fascistic forces. The New Republic of the sequel trilogy, which grew out of the Resistance after the defeat of the Empire, has many continuity allusions to its predecessor. However, the directors of these later works were not as explicitly political in their work as Lucas was. As Disney shies away from overt politics and its properties, despite various controversies claiming the opposite, the New Republic seems to draw from some of the same real-world influences that the old Rebellion did, albeit in a more generic way. The New Republic, thus, is a more general democratic movement fighting a fascist other, the First Order. Unlike the Rebellion, the New Republic is forced to contend with the gritty issues of being an actual governing body. However, there are attempts by the writers to say something new with the material they are given. During the New Republic's arrival in Exegol in The Rise of Skywalker, we see a diverse set of characters arriving on ships and fighting alongside Rey. This ragtag army consists of multiple species and multiple types of people fighting against the First Order, showing that the average person can stand up to authoritarianism and fascism, and in fact be key to the efforts that bring down fascist regimes. While politics in the sequels is far less prevalent than it is in the original trilogy, these are some of the themes that seem to be present. Much like the Rebel Alliance draws inspiration from real-world anti-colonial movements, so too does the Empire draw inspiration from real-world colonial empires. In a direct parallel to the Rebellion's analogue in the Viet Cong, the Empire is by no means a one-to-one -one imitation of the American military-industrial complex. Instead, it is a more general allusion to imperial powers in general, bearing similarities also to the Roman Empire and the British Empire. As a World War II historical buff, Lucas drew heavy inspiration from Nazi Germany in the design choices of the Empire. Opposing the gritty and generally heterogeneous rebellion, the Empire, with its aptly named stormtroopers, is homogeneous and militaristic. They also use overwhelming force to defeat their enemies, using the stormtroopers as a war machine of terror. The Imperial officers are dressed in dark grey clothes reminiscent of Wehrmacht officers, and Darth Vader himself seems dressed in a way that personifies space fascism. His master, Darth Sidious, stands around a cult of personality, which has similarities to cults of leaders in fascist regimes, and this is further expressed in the prequels, where he manipulates democracy in his favour, much like fascists do. The Empire's guns, according to Kempshol, are simply grandiose and are meant to be outlandish. The Death Star, meant to be a weapon of mass destruction, is a mega-project that is completely destructive, a military base that also has planet-busting firepower. Mega-projects, ever-present in authoritarian regimes throughout the real world as a means to display strength and authority, are personalised in the Death Star. The Empire's efficient brutality is seen in the original films through its willingness to commit war crimes on a galactic scale, such as through the destruction of Alderaan, working with slavers like Jabba the Hutt, and the use of torture. Much like the rebels are inspired by the Viet Cong, but taken to the abstract, so is the Empire inspired by the American and Nazi empires, but taken to be an abstract analogy of all Imperial forces. The First Order, essentially the fanboys of the Empire and its successors, are a creation of the 2010s and are reminiscent of the politics of that decade. J.J. Abrams has mentioned that Nazis are an inspiration for the First Order. Their use of slavery in the new stormtroopers, their militarism that both exceeds and emulates the Empire, as well as the machismo and toxicity of Kylo Ren are also indirectly inspired by fascist movements. Not the fascist empires of the 20th century this time, but the neo-fascist movements of our generation who fight on the streets for control of society. Captain Phasma essentially takes this role as an ideological leader of the slave army of the First Order. Much like how modern neo-fascist movements venerate the Nazi regime of old, the First Order also fetishizes the Empire, as seen by Kylo Ren trying to make his uniform to be like Darth Vader. The structure of the First Order is riddled with factionalism and is oppressive. In fact, one could claim that General Hux's spying for the resistance is precisely because this factionalism gives him a lack of respect. By contrast, the true ideologue, General Pride, is happy to do Palpatine's bidding because he truly believes in the ideals of the First Order. 
In the real world, fascism is an ideology exceptionally prone to infighting, and this is reflected in the Star Wars sequels. The opportunism and orthodoxy that often compete in reactionary, authoritarian and fascist movements is laid completely bare in the First Order. The dissatisfaction of some characters like Kylo Ren, the naked ideology of Pride and the opportunism of Hux are all reflections of various actors who appear in reactionary or far-right movements and regimes. Having now covered the real-world inspirations behind the factions of the original trilogy and sequel trilogy, let us now move on to the prequel trilogy. The factions of the prequel trilogy, the Republic and the Separatist Federation, have more elusive undertones in terms of inspiration than the Rebel Alliance and the Galactic Empire. The essence of Lucas's vision for the Republic in the prequels is best surmised by the words of Senator Padme Amidala, so this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. Lucas's inspiration for the Republic stems from various democracies in decline, from the Roman Republic to the French Republic during the Revolution. However, the heaviest inspiration comes from the presidencies of Richard Nixon and George W. Bush. The attempts by the former to lengthen his rule through constitutional amendments and the militarism of the latter were inspirations for the development of the prequels as an allegory for how easily democratic societies can be put on the slippery slope to authoritarianism. There is much talk in the prequels about the various issues that plague the democracy of the Galactic Republic. One is the bureaucracy and the long deliberations that delay the solution of problems. This is seen in the attacks on Naboo in The Phantom Menace, and how Sheev Palpatine manipulates Padme into issuing a vote of no confidence against Chancellor Valorum. There is also major corruption and ossification in the Republic, with the war with the Trade Federation beginning because of a trade dispute. The state capture of money in the Republic is an analogy for how money corrupts politics as it does in the modern United States. This even extends to the Jedi, a point we will get to soon. The prequels are not a critique of democracy, but rather a critique of the things that corrupt it. The bureaucrats who move strings, the capitalists who turn the ship of state to their own ends, and the ones who will try to capture the state to turn it into an empire. For Lucas, Chris Kempshaw notes, the greatest threat to democracy is not that it might be taken away, but that it may be given away. The executive powers given to Sheev Palpatine in Attack of the Clones are much like the powers assumed by the US government during the War on Terror, or the powers given to Caesar as dictator in the waning days of the Roman Republic. Likewise, the use of the Jedi attack on Palpatine to declare the Empire is not unlike how Hitler utilized the panic in the wake of the Reichstag fire to assume dictatorial powers and restore stability. The primary adversary the Republic faced during the Clone Wars was the Confederacy of Independent Systems. There's no clear analogy that explains what this separatist faction stands for. They are a faction with grievances against the Republic, which leads to a trade dispute and eventually a war. We must keep in mind that this crisis is a creation of Palpatine, who eludes the ossified Jedi Order and the bureaucracy of the Republic. It can be surmised that through his portrayal of the Separatists, Lucas was trying to show a common cause of war, trade disputes, and consequently how these crises can manufacture consent for authoritarian regimes to seize control over the vehicle of democracy. In Attack of the Clones, the discussion between Padme and Anakin on Naboo is a clear example of this. Padme shows sympathy for the Separatists, even if they attacked Naboo at the start of the war, and even hoped to negotiate with them. Anakin is vehement in his opinion that there should be a wise hand to guide politicians in what is in the best interest. Through the Separatists, Anakin and Padme project opposing viewpoints on democracy. For Anakin, democracy is a nuisance that gets in the way of action, a clear path towards fascism and authoritarianism. Padme, on the other hand, acknowledges that, however frustrating deliberation and disagreement may be, they are a fundamental and important part of democracy. In Revenge of the Sith, she clearly states that the foundations of the Republic have been corrupted by the war, and that they have become the very evil we are fighting against. The Separatists reflect the politics of the Republic, its failures, and the ability of the totalitarian Palpatine to manufacture consent for his rule. Let us now move on from the main political factions of the galaxy and discuss the foundations of the Star Wars universe, the Jedi and the Sith. The Jedi, for their part, are clearly inspired by the samurai of feudal Japan, or at least how they are portrayed in the classic cinema of legendary director Akira Kurosawa. In fact, Lucas has stated the name Jedi itself was inspired by the Japanese word for period drama, or Jidaigeki. 
The mixture of conflict with spiritual themes is a key tenet of how samurai are portrayed in the media, and Star Wars takes from these sources quite liberally. The Jedi have a code and structure that is reminiscent of this, and their devotion to the light side of the Force is analogous to the devotion to the samurai's code of Bushido. As Master Yoda states, a Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. Clearly the core virtues of the Jedi are honor, keeping the peace, and meditating on the Force. These ideals are put under strain by the Clone Wars, which causes the Jedi to get caught up in politics, something which makes them go from peacekeepers to military generals, a direct catalyst to their fall at Palpatine's hands. To exemplify just how far from their main values they strayed by the time of the prequel trilogy, they did nothing against slavery on Tatooine, but then also tried to extrajudicially murder Palpatine. Similarly, the samurai of our world, while often lionized as spiritually enlightened warriors of virtue, were also tools of the state, used to keep the powerful in power and keep the poor in line, and prone to disregarding their personal codes of honor if it suited their political needs. The Sith, on the other hand, are a faction which grew out of the Jedi, and are their antithesis in many ways. Their inspiration lies in concepts of hatred and insecurity, as evidenced by Yoda's warning to Anakin on the dangers of fear leading to suffering in The Phantom Menace. Many have noted the names of Sith Lords reflecting their warlike and destructive nature, like Darth Vader, which sounds like Invader, Darth Sidious, which sounds like Insidious, Count Dooku, which sounds like the Japanese word for poison, and Darth Tyrannus, which sounds like Tyrant. Like the galactic empire they created, the Sith are deeply rooted in fascist ideology, as seen in the toxicity and chaos that corrupt people like Kylo Ren and Anakin Skywalker and cause them to commit heinous atrocities against innocents. The Sith are also master manipulators, who utilize emotionally abusive behaviors to use others. Palpatine, for example, manipulates Anakin into becoming dependent on him, and Anakin himself ends up trapping Padme in a toxic relationship. At the same time, the Sith are adaptable, something the Jedi routinely fail to be, and are deeply committed to machismo and violence, as seen in the Empire and First Order. These are metaphors for the challenges posed by, and the false appeal of, authoritarianism and fascism. On a personal level, the Sith are often magnificently tragic and sympathetic, depicted as people who are traumatized and corrupted by the dark side, giving in to their greed, hatred and ignorance. Thus, while they may seem cool to us, they are cautionary tales, as their failings destroy the galaxy, their loved ones, and eventually themselves. The Star Wars franchise has had many iterations, but its factions have shown some broader thematic continuities. As every installment has come, different aspects have reflected various influences and historical inspirations. There are influences from other historical events and characters. The major factions we know, from the Empire to the Rebels to the Jedi and the Sith, have a diverse array of historical analogies. From the Roman Empire to Fascism, and from populist movements to the Viet Cong, the themes of political struggle appear throughout the Star Wars universe. This is the strength of the franchise, the ability to become a canvas to tell stories that are both timeless and of their time. One of the most interesting parts of Star Wars is these very themes that pervade the franchise like the Force itself does, and it is these that have drawn people to cherish Star Wars for almost half a century and beyond. This series will soon continue. To ensure you don't miss it, please subscribe and make sure you have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment, we will try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we'll catch you on the next one.